Hello, and welcome to episode number 22 of the Beta Bay podcast. I'm your host, Seb Fry, and for this episode, I have special guest Danette Lawrence. Danette is an interior designer and decorator. She's been doing this kind of work for well over 20 years now. She's got a really great sense of design and aesthetic and a a style and a taste that uh, I really admire, and she has a lot of information to share with us about what's going on in uh, the latest interior design trends. Uh, She has a very unique perspective, and I think you're really going to enjoy listening to what Danette has to say. So without further ado, sit down, relax, and listen to my interview with Danette Lawrence. Okay, today uh, on the podcast, we have Danette Lawrence. Danette, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Seb. Thanks for having me. Right on, right on. So, Danette, I like to start off these things by asking my guests to tell me a little story. Do you have a little story you can share with us? You know, it's funny. I There's a whole bunch of stories, of course, but I don't consider myself a storyteller, but I will let you in on a little secret story that I play over in my mind when I go see my dad and my stepmother in the foothills of the Sierras. They live in the country. They're wonderful people. They're both retired my stepmother is a horsewoman, and my father is a retired fireman. And like I said, they live in the country. And when I go there, you know, being a designer, it's really funny because, and I try—I don't do this in, in most people's houses, but I do it in my family's houses um, and, you know, clients, of course. But when I go there, I secretly have this fantasy that I'm going to send them on a trip and I'm going to paint and uh, redo their house while they're away because it's, it's, <laughs> um, it's pretty interesting. You know, the bathroom, the little half bath when you come in from the utility room where the washer and dryer is, is it just hasn't been touched. And the kitchen is, is really nice. It's open and bright and um, spacious and wonderful place for gathering, but it just needs a little facelift. And the, the, the living room is um, beige. So they have some really nice things, but the way that they're sprinkled around or displayed is, it's just not the, it doesn't have a lot of life and excitement in it. So that's my, my story for you for the moment, is I have this idea that I want to send them on a trip and, uh, you know, push the envelope and just, redecorate and do some some redos in their house while they're away. Just enough to get them outside of their comfort zone and enough to make them go, oh, this is fabulous. Why didn't I think of this? Well, hey, I have a great idea. How about you send me on a trip and then you come to my house and redecorate it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want to do that, we can do that. <laughs> Win-win. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hawaii would be good and Mexico. I mean, even like San Diego would be fine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So, so you're a uh, you're an interior designer. Is that is that right? That's true. Yes. Right on. And so, uh, where did you grow up? Where are you from? I'm from the area. I grew up in the Mountain View area, and then we moved up to the Santa Cruz Mountains. And I lived in Boulder Creek in the sixth grade. Um, I've also lived in Southern California, but that was in my in my 20s, and um, that's where I first started doing uh, placement. I like to call it placement, and and it's about, I think design a lot of times too is about the art of placement, so that's where I was doing um, set dressing. Right, right. So where'd you end up going to school? I mean, you said you, you what, how old were you when you moved to Boulder Creek, or where, where'd you end up, you know, doing the school? Is it Mountain View mostly, or...? I, well, I, my really formative years from sixth grade on were in the Santa Cruz area. So this is kind of my home base. I love it here. And uh, I don't have an ASID degree. I'm not formally taught, although, you know, I'm constantly learning about design and interiors and that. I think it's one of the great things about life is we get to continue learning as we grow older. But um, I actually have a business degree 
And that has helped, although the business side of it is just not as much fun, of course, as the placement side of it and helping people rework their interiors. What's an uh, ASID? What is that? Uh, American Society of Interior Designers. Oh, okay. All right. So there's they several to, different... Go ahead. Oh, they have like a, like a degree program at accredited, accredited universities, or is it their own thing? Well, it's their own thing, but there are different degree programs online that you can go through. I mean, now that we have the Internet, you can do online courses. And actually, that's something that I have considered because the side of it where, like the 3D modeling part of that, I have a guy that I work with who will do that kind of stuff if people want to walk, knock out walls or expand or do additions. Um, there are some incredible and relatively easy programs to, that you can use, but the, also the online courses and stuff teach some of that stuff. So um, it's something that I don't have in my toolbox at the moment. Like I said, I have a guy who does that, but it's something that I'm considering. It would be wonderful to have that piece also fleshed out. Right, right. Cool. <laughs> So, um, uh, what what did you what was the inspiration for getting into interior design work? How did that how did that happen for you? Well, I have done all kinds of, um, you know, one of my passions is streamlining, and I don't know if you and I uh, in our business dealings have talked that much about it. But um, as Americans, you know, we're so blessed to be in a culture of acquisition. So. It's easy to get possessions. We have the money to do it. We have the means to do it. We have everything we could possibly want. We can get most things shipped directly to our doors these days. So I've done a lot of helping people to clear their environments. And one of my personal philosophies about that is it's really hard to have good design when the environment is completely cluttered, whether that's your office or your home or uh, a workspace, uh, even a, like an artist studio. And I know that artists um, generally do work with a certain amount of chaos. So I've done that kind of thing. As I said, I did set dressing for some time. And, you know, this was when my son was young and I was living in Southern California um, working in Chatsworth where there's a lot of small studios where you would, you know, you work there and then you go out into the field and you're on location one of the fun things about that for me was I really learned about placement and the art of improvisation. Because you can be out on location and maybe you have the right tools, but something breaks and you still got to get those curtains hung or you still have to make sure that the door is going to swing open properly when you know, the person walks through it and different things of that nature. So learning how to improvise and think on my feet has always been I think it's a pretty good skill that I have. Um, so I've done that kind of stuff. I also have done uh, the visual merchandise manager for a luxury goods company. And during that time, I was a buyer. And I was also um, hosting uh, locally our first Fridays in the downtown area and uh, working with different artists who were painters or sculptors, or jewelry artists, or glass artists, or ceramicists, or textile artists, and working with them, they would bring their, their collections in, and I would work with them and, and curate those items and display them. So um, it was really wonderful to be able to look at a lot of different types of art media and um, help them to show it in the best light. Because one of the things about that um, for open studios artists also is that they, they first they want to do their craft. And second, it would be nice if they made some money and other people loved their craft as well, you know? Right. So I've worked with um, open studios artists, um, helping them get their studios ready for the October walkthroughs and things of that nature. And... The um, interior piece just is a natural fit. I think I, as a kid, would always um, set up households. I remember even doing it in kindergarten. That was my favorite place to be other than on the playground. We had a little area where we would set up our store or we would set up a little, you know, living room area and things of that nature. And then as an adult, I have a tendency to move the furniture around for two reasons. One, it's a great shift in perspective. 
You know, if you want to shake things up, if you want to invite something new into your life, you know, move all the furniture, clean all the baseboards, get all the cobwebs down, get rid of a few items, maybe bring in one or two focal pieces, and that whole perspective, it will shift. And I just love the idea of that, is being able to really move things around. I mean, there's so much, life is exciting. And there's so much movement in life. So I, I've always kind of done those things. So doing interiors, I love to help people bring a vision or an idea or a concept to life. So you said that you were down in L.A. working on, like, TV shows and stuff like that. Uh, are there any TV shows that we might be familiar with that you uh, helped dress the sets for? <laughs> Probably not. The, the one that I worked on the longest was called Dark Justice. Dark and justice. it was, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was uh, a superior court judge. So he was a judge by day, vigilante by night. And nice. um, <laughs> he had a motorcycle team that he, you know, it was, it, we had a lot of fun working on that show. Now I did work, um, I had a couple of friends that were electricians. So one of my friends uh, took me on a Guns N' Roses uh, video shoot, and we were at this big wave making pool, um, you know, mechanical wave maker. I don't remember the exact location of that one, and it was probably a song that is a popular song because Guns N' Roses is a pretty popular uh, rock and roll band, but I don't remember the exact parts of that. But I remember, you know, pulling on these long lines of cable and the wave pool going and it being late at night and there'd be music and lights. And so that was pretty fun. That was actually really a, a good time. And I enjoyed the dark justice too. I used to drive the, the big um, five ton truck, big cab overhead and go to these different prop houses and pick up props and different things for dressing sets on location and at the studio. Wow, that's pretty cool. So uh, was it like a big, I mean, this is like when, the, in the early 90s, I see that Dark Justice was yeah. on. In the, so uh, so was there a lot of like uh, crazy Hollywood stuff going on? I mean, were there a lot of like fabulous parties with, you know, uh, celebrities? Well, there, and, there, was, there was some of that stuff. I mean, we always would do rap parties, you know. So when you finish a season, you have a big rap party. We would have, um, Jessica Redgrave was a guest on our show one time she was probably the most uh, famous guest that, that I admired oh, and had who was that? on the show. Who was Jessica that? Jessica Redgrave. Jessica Redgrave. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. Oh, and then okay. <laughs> we also had Eric Estrada oh, uh, nice. come and be on our show one time. Did you meet him? Um, I did. He was hitting on me. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Which was right, very strange. You, know, you were, I was you were pretty young then, right? Work. You must you I, have been yeah, like a little baby. I, I was just a baby then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, so you rebuffed yeah, was, him. You were like, no, fun. Eric Estrada. That's inappropriate. Yeah, I, absolutely. <laughs> it's like, I'm just here to work. You, you should be doing your job too. Don't you have right, lines exactly. you need to learn aren't or you, something? Aren't you a grandfather? <laughs> Don't you have a grandbaby you can take care of? <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right on. Well, that's pretty cool. So how long were you in L.A. for? Were you there just like a couple of years or were you there like I 10 years? Was there for about, I was there for about five years. Uh-huh. Five yeah. years in L.A. I was there so what, for about... Go ahead. Oh, what brought you back? Why, why did you leave L.A. and come back to uh, the promised land over here? Well, my son was really young. And, you know, the interesting thing about Los Angeles is it's, well, it's happening all over the world, of course, is that it's very fast-paced. And it's very difficult to create deep friendships there. And all of my family is here. My son's grandparents are here. Um, all, you know, I wanted him to grow up in a place that, you know, we could settle down into a neighborhood and he could go to the same school year over year and the pace would be relatively slow. Um, and, you know, the, the hours working on television shows, too, with a young child, those two things don't jive very well. You need a lot of support and you know, there's sacrifices that have to be made. Um, so I ended up getting out of the movie business to come back here and and raise my son. Right, right. Well, that's a good reason. Yeah, it's the best reason. <laughs> right, that's the best reason. <laughs> hey, speaking of TV, do you uh, do you you know that guy Jeff Lewis? 
on uh, on Bravo. And that show flipping out. Have you ever seen that? Yes, I have. So, what do you think about like Jeff Lewis and like all those other kind of like HGTV like home design shows? I think they're any good. Are they totally fake or what? What's what's your take on all that stuff? Well, it's interesting because it's really wonderful entertainment, and um, I think we're definitely. You know, we're, we're beguiled by uh, live television or seemingly the drama of real life. And certainly design does have drama in it because it's a lot of moving parts. It's a lot of components. It's a lot of things to keep track of. Inevitably, things go wrong. Things aren't delivered on time um, and things of that nature. I'm not super fond of his show necessarily. I think he's brilliant. Um, I think most designers... You know, some of my top favorites, they just do things in a way that um, there's a certain magic. They bring a certain extra something. I really love, the one I watched most recently that I kind of binge watched actually was on Netflix. It's called The The Great Design Challenge. And it's a bunch of regular people. They have other types of careers. A lot of them are, are created. So they're doing art or they're writing books or they're, building furniture or things of that nature, and they, they are pitted against each other to keep these incredibly low budgets and these incredibly tight time frames. And they, they take the brief from the client, the client tells them what they want, and they have to execute on that. And it's just interesting to watch people put their own spin on things, and some of them just, they, they just, they don't listen to the client. And it's really strange because really isn't that what this is about is to, to serve the client, right? Right. Um, on HGTV, I do like Fixer Upper with Chip and Joanna Gaines, although, I mean, I think I like the story of it, you know, the family and the kids and the farm and, you know, they came from just being unknown people to having this incredible industry. I think one of the things that I've noticed about her designs is that it's a lot the same stuff. It's very right. beautiful, but it's a lot the same kind of thing. Um, and I think that part of the design and the design challenge and being a good designer is really being able to be agile around what people like, whether that's very traditional, whether it's modern traditional, whether it's um, very eclectic, you know, things of that nature. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, so I've actually heard of that great interior design challenge. That's a British show, is that right? It is great. <laughs> yeah, it's right. British. Uh, are, there, are there similar are there styles pretty similar to what's going on here, or is it like totally like Euro flavor? Well, interestingly, um, there's some really brilliant stuff that comes out of that uh, as far as the design and the designers and the innovation and the ability to execute is tremendous because, as I was saying, they're given, these, they're given something like a 1,000 pounds and they're working on maybe just one room, but they've got two days or three days to execute that. And it's really difficult because you go from concept to, to finished product in two days is it's, it's amazing. You know, really? They have, wow. They have a small team, but still, to, to pull Dude. that off is, you know, you don't sleep. You, you're working right. all right. You know, you're around working. the clock. Right. But yeah, two, one of the things that days. I noticed, <laughs> one of the things I noticed about the style component, and maybe it is just, a, a you know, a, um, an English versus American thing, is there's a way to put a, um, a rug in a room. And the rules are, and the rules that I try and follow as much as possible are, if you have a sitting room and you have a rug in the center of the sitting room, the front legs of all of the furniture, furniture excuse me, should be on that rug. So the rug needs to be big enough for the room. And in this particular British series, all of the rugs that were placed, it was the one thing that I noticed repeatedly, were these very small rugs in the center between all of the furniture. So I thought that was really peculiar, and I don't know if that's a, a particular rule that they utilize or it was just an afterthought. I'm, I'm very curious about that 
piece of it. Maybe they ran out of money because they only had 1,000 pounds. <laughs> that was the biggest <laughs> rug they could afford. <laughs> yes, and something's got to give, you know. <laughs> right. So what would you say in a case like that? You're like, I can't afford a big enough rug. Would you just say no rug at all then? Or would you say go ahead and, you know, uh, use a rug that's too small for the room? Well, that's an interesting piece. Um, a client that I worked with in the fall last year had me come in. He bought this big, beautiful house up in the mountains, and, you know, he, his business is in Alaska, so he's living here half the time, uh, living here in the winter, of course. And we were looking at rugs for the great room, and the first, I bought him a rug for his bedroom, and he, he loved it. It's that, you know, rolled up for a while, but he loved it when we unrolled it. But he wanted to get a rug in the great room for a pretty low price, I had gone to the design center because he said I want traditional hand knotted, and you know had enough money to buy a really nice rug. And uh, this particular client, I had asked repeatedly, "Well, what's my budget?" You know, because a budget is such an important jumping-off point. The budget will inform everything, right? But he wouldn't give me a budget, so I thought, "Well, I'm going to be at the design center. I'll go and look in this fabulous rug." warehouse with these gorgeous handmade rugs, you know, $14,000 for a rug. And um, I came back, I brought some pictures back, he saw them, and I told him the price, and he was like, what? (laughs) So he wanted to get a really inexpensive rug. He wanted to spend $800 on a rug. And what I said to him was, it's so important that we get you a really nice rug. Because one of the things about a rug, an area rug, is it's going to show wear, right? If right. you, you're, you entertain a lot or if you have pets or children and it's underfoot, even if you take your shoes off, that thing, if it's not a quality um, component, it's going to show wear. So you're better off putting a little extra money into the rug, I think. And also, the piece of, about that is that that is the anchoring point for that room. So it makes sense to invest in, in something that's good quality. And I would say... Um, depending upon my client's needs, I would probably, um, depending, like I said, I would probably put a a good amount of money into the rug itself if they wanted a rug. That or I would leave the rug out. Right. Did I answer the question? (laughs) Yes, you did, basically, which is depending. You know, every case is unique, obviously, but don't, 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 don't skimp on the rug. If you can't get a if you can't get a good rug and well, like I like to say, a poor man can't afford cheap stuff, right? I mean, <laughs> just better to get the, better get the right stuff the first time and not have to be replacing it and upgrading it and fiddling with it, you know, uh, down the road. That's what True. I say. Anyway. Yes. that's my that's my feeling. It's I think it's really important too, and I think that that is another component of just the design aspect is you want to get the best stuff you can afford. And if that means getting fewer components, like getting your anchor pieces to start and then working on getting, you know, the accessories right. as you go, right. it Good makes point. more sense to do that, Good I point. think, because you want to have a sofa that you love and that's going to serve you well and going to stand up to your entertaining needs or, you know, the needs of your family, Um because things are, you know, things can get, things are pricey, and we have so many choices, right? So it's right. better to just invest in something that's quality from the from the get go. Right, right, yeah. Less is more for sure. Less is more, <laughs> especially if you have less. <laughs> right. <laughs> less is definitely more. Hey, so uh, do you have any uh, like um, you know visual artists that you really think are cool? And by visual artists, I mean like painters or like I don't know sculptors or you know any anybody or, you know or interior designers that that really you sort of like look to for inspiration. I do actually. You know, I just saw. Well, I saw it twice at the Santa Cruz or excuse me, the San Jose Museum of Art. They had this Latvian. Uh, painter Raymond Staprins, and he, his work uh, was really incredible. He actually lives in San Francisco. His wife is a scientist. He's in his 90s, and he he's still painting. 
But this this show that was at the San Jose Museum, one of the things that I loved about it is that when I first walked in, I, I definitely saw uh, a similarity to uh, Richard Diebenkorn's work and also who's a, a very well-known barrier artist from the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then also, um, I think his name is William Tebow, who does this amazing stuff almost with rainbow colors. And if uh, let's see how I can explain that. Is his use of color is fascinating because he will layer these colors right next to each other in succession and create shadows and highlights and um, variations on that. So um, I just love this Raymond Stafford because he was a new artist I had not even heard of. I went with a friend and we decided let's go back again because it was so brilliant. But it's this, he does um, abstract, but there's also realism paired in there and just beautiful things like there was a painting of a chair. And when you really started looking at the chair, it wasn't even an actual chair structurally. There was like a leg like, missing in the back and the way, it, you know, the way he had painted it was just extraordinary. It had movement and it had a life of its own. It was just brilliant. Um, I love Frank Stella. And I love, one of the things I love about Frank Stella is his geometries and the, his use of color, again, is just, uh, subtle and amazing. He he um, tones down colors, so uh, he might use some saturated colors, but he still add a lot of white in there. So they're they're kind of soft and they're they're almost pastelly. And I'm not a huge fan of pastel. I think used in the right application, it can be really beautiful and brilliant. But um, I love his uh, ability to create these beautiful geometric paintings. And then also, he does these huge sculptures. I saw him at the, I think it was at the De Young. Um, no, it might have been at the MoMA, San Francisco MoMA. I can't remember at the moment. But yeah, his work is just beautiful and amazing. And then... Um, an older artist, a historical artist, is J.M.W. Turner. And he is a painter who uh, captures light in one of the most amazing ways I've ever seen. Uh, he does a lot of landscape, a lot of oceanscapes. He would paint uh, ships and um, the long view of these amazing countrysides and the way that he could make light come through clouds or hit the ocean, hit the water, it's just extraordinary. And one of the other things that I just loved about his work is that um, he used octagonal frames or he would use, I believe he even used round, but he didn't use just square frames, which I thought was really brilliant for that time period. I think he's eight. 18th century, early 19th century artist. Um, then as far as, let's see, interior designers, um, Kelly Wurstler, who is an L.A. artist, she's got a huge industry uh, of her own home goods and design um, company. She that is really interesting because she's very punchy and quirky and does these very animated grooms with... Uh, there's a lot of life in them, and they definitely push the envelope. So I love her stuff. She has grown into a, a, a kind of a giant locally in the, in the California industry and, and beyond. And um, also um, someone who's more classic design is Alessandra, Alessandra Branca. She does this amazing kind of traditional, very... Um, so what I think about it, I think it's very, mm, it's got a kind of an Americana feel. It's got a, uh, a freshness. She uses, uh, she captures light in every room and then uses, but still uses a lot of color. So she can do very bold and inspiring things or she can do it very toned down and traditional, but she puts a twist on everything that she does. She's an Italian uh, who is based in Chicago or was based in Chicago. 
And then um, finally, there's um, uh, Francis Sultana, this gentleman who does this. Uh, it's so lush. It's kind of a Baroque and modern together, which is kind of a, it's a, it's a feat to pull off something like that. I, I think that his work is, um, there's a richness to it. And I, uh, I love the idea of having our homes inspire us and make us feel like we are the king or queen of our own castle. And his interiors really, they take that kind of old world style and, and, and blend it with uh, functionality and modern, modernity. And it just is so beautiful. He just does beautiful, beautiful stuff. Yeah, I'm looking at his uh, website right now, francissultana.com. And, uh, yeah, I really love it. That's really great stuff. Yeah, it's really yeah, it's super. Yeah, it's isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. It's really great stuff. So what do you think are some of the hottest trends in home design today? What's, what's, what's really setting the, design, the home design world on fire? Well, you know, it's so funny. Um, wallpaper. <laughs> wallpaper <laughs> is making a comeback in a I huge heard that. way. It is. And, you know, the wonderful thing about wallpaper is that, you know, my generation, your generation, our generation, we kind of think of wallpaper as being very traditional and, you know, it's like that thing that you think, oh, my God, if you ever have to take it off the wall, you'll just want to pull your hair out. But I actually did, I talked one of my clients into doing a focal wall in his master suite in wallpaper and he's a very manly man. He is uh, recently divorced. He's divorced in the last few years, has this beautiful master suite that he's always wanted to redesign. And this wallpaper was gorgeous. And I found three different samples for him. I talked him into it, but I kept kind of pushing for it because I knew that it was just going to be a wonderful way to enter into this this beautiful room that he had. And he and I actually hung that wallpaper. We hung, what, uh, 12 foot, he has 12 foot ceilings in there. So that focal wall was four feet wide, 12 feet tall. Um, with a, uh, let's see, there's four feet on the bottom that was stone up the side of the wall. That couldn't do anything about that. But anyway, we hung that wallpaper in two long strips. So those strips were eight feet long, two feet wide. He and I hung that in an hour, just over an hour. And the thing about that is wallpaper now comes, you can get it in vinyl with an adhesive backing. And it's a dream. It's literally a dream to put up. I mean, it's not, if you're a DIY person, which, of course, I, I am one of those people. I love the challenge of, of making it happen. And it, it went up like a dream and it was it's beautiful and he 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 just has thanked me ever since so wallpaper is one of those um i think that another thing that's really going to be hot and i've been looking at it online and i've seen it in i think it was the crate and barrel magazine i was looking in the other day is um there's a lot more curves in home design there's curved furniture there's actually semi-round sectional pieces there's a lot of arc lamps and lighting that is um, softer. It's not straight up and down. Um, rugs come in curves now. There's everything from bar carts to, you know, softer shapes and furniture, um, lots of relaxed lines. And I, and I really like that because I think that we are so planar. I mean, look at your rooms. They're all square, right? So it makes sense to shake it up and add some softness in there. But we've got poofs that are really hot, you know, the trend of the big round, using that as an ottoman or additional seating. So that's a, that's a great um, trend that's happening. Also, something that I thought was interesting is there's this idea of transient design where uh, consumers are buying better stuff, as we talked about before, um, that have a great design that, that fit more of a period in their life instead of buying things that are more heirloom. So a lot of the younger people um, are not as interested in things like antiques necessarily. They might put some of that in their homes, but they're not decorating all that, the, the entire home with those types of things. And there's, you can really do some beautiful stuff with some, you know, cleaner lines, more modern pieces that are 
um, sitting next to things that might be an heirloom. Maybe you have your grandma's sideboard that you're using in your dining room, but you have a much more refined and uh, modern dining table and things of that nature. So it's, it's something called transient design, which I just love that idea. Um, and really buying quality things that, in, in that regard. Um, also something that I'm so happy about because I think that it's such an important, easy design concept is botanicals. Plants are making a comeback. There's a lot more of, uh, there's prints on upholstery, you know, we've got lots, lots of palms, um, lots of green and white and all of those vibrant uh, growing colors. There's even uh, florals are making a comeback. There's things, they're, they're in wallpaper, you can find them in pillows and rugs. I saw this amazing lamp, hanging lamp on that design challenge show that was, uh, I don't know what we call it in America, but they call it a cheese plant. In, the Brits call it a cheese plant, and it was made of these, I think it was brass leaves that hung down like a chandelier. It was stunning. So, it, you know, we want to bring the outside in. We're also busy. It's like being able to find that time outside with our kids or go for bike rides or sit out on the patio and and look at the trees and things like that. Well, that's one way that we can really enhance our homes is by live plants or by prints. And right. let's see. One other thing that is uh, changing is browns are making a comeback. What are? We're moving away from grays and blues. Oh, browns. Which always, yeah, browns and earth tones. Earth browns, tones, right. Browns, creams, terracottas, things of that nature. So... Maybe not so much for the paint colors, but the way that we bring in the woods and the natural elements, um, cushions and textural pieces like that. Um, so browns are actually the earth tones are making a comeback too. Well, that's pretty interesting because you know when I when I stage a house or get ready to sell a house, I'm always like focusing on uh, how to make it brighter inside. I mean, doesn't does, right. wouldn't the use of brown tones inside kind of like sort of defeat that objective or is there a way you can do it and have it look bright inside while still using those tones? Well, I think that there's a way to do it, have it look bright inside while using those tones. And one of the things to do in that regard is to kind of consider the, I always consider the home when I'm working either doing design or staging. And um, I just unstaged a house yesterday that the realtor had had the floors refinished. He tore the carpet up, thank goodness. And what was underneath were these beautiful, I think they were, let me say they were redwoods, maybe not. Um, but he had them stained dark, and they were gorgeous. And so I used, uh, to contrast with that really dark wood on the floor, I used light wood for the, the copy table and um, the sofa I didn't like. But what I did to bring in some life was I used a beautiful teal color. I used some teal accents. It carried that through the rest of the house. So, you know, some people love kind of that soft, very uh, monochromatic or neutral interior um, scape, but you can really punch it up in, in easy ways if, if that is your basic palette, right? Right, so you can have it sort of uh, contrast with other um, contrast with other other elements that are brighter. Absolutely, yeah, right. definitely. You could bring in any number. You know, pick your favorite color, and you can add it. If you have neutrals, you can pick your favorite color and add that in in doses. And and the other great thing about having a more neutral palette on the interior, you know, in your sofa or some of your furnishings or things of that nature, is that it's easy to switch it out and change things up as far as accessorizing with some of the soft goods, right? Right, right. So, um, you know, you mentioned wallpaper earlier, and uh, <laughs> I, I can't help but wonder, I mean, is this one of those things that we're going to look back on in like 10 or 15 years and say, like, hey, what, what were they thinking? <laughs> I mean, uh, are there other things that you think are happening today that people are going to look back and, you know, in 10 or 15 years from now and going like, geez, that, that was maybe not, such a great idea. Well, I think one of the things about that is um, it's it's really fun to change our environments. I I actually, from the 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 less is more standpoint, I think everybody should 
have to consider moving every 10 or 15 years because it really makes you take stock of what you've got, what you've acquired, and, and what's important to you. But from the other perspective, as far as the wallpaper thing, um, I don't know that I'm an advocate for putting <laughs> floral wallpaper on every room of your bedroom wall. I don't would not agree with that. But something like a powder room, a guest powder room downstairs, or putting it in an entry where you have a wall that needs, you know, a little happy place. Uh, maybe you have a console in there where it catches the keys in the mail, and you put your your things that um, you know your bags down as you come into the house. I, I love the idea of doing it as a focal point. Um, and I think that there with, you know, it's a design element. And just like everything, design changes as far as like what's on trend, what's not trending. I have a tendency to really feel like people should decorate in a way that makes them happy. This is about you and your lifestyle and what you're really into. So if you love that graphic wallpaper, let's go for it. I mean, I'm on board to do that. If you love a hot pink sofa and you're going to be happy with that, well, then you should have that um, because it's not the end of the world if in five years you decide, you know what, I want a different sofa. Right. You have to, you know, it, it, you know, that's an important component. I think one of the things that's really funny, I, I was thinking about this and thinking about trends that are, you know, been so hot and so happening, and I would say, but the one thing that I think people might regret, and this is just my perspective, is that, um, you know, the Edison bulbs, if you have a lot of those in your house, you might regret that. Edison because bulbs? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah. You what know, it, kind of the bare bulb and the, the, it, the very, like, um, Oh, right, those pendant 19, lights that you see all over the place now. Yeah, pendant lights. They do them in wall sconces. You can get them in standing lamps. I mean, a little bit is okay, but too much is too much. I love the idea of that being, you know, there, it's very trendy as far as if you go to restaurants or if you go um, to different locations to have food or have drinks and stuff. And I think it works, but it's also because it's been on trend for, what, six, seven years now, I, I personally, I, I'm, I'm ready to move on to something You're else. You're over it. <laughs> I am. You're over I it. I am, you know. Um, it's definitely... That particular look kind of confines uh, confines a design, you know. And I am an advocate of much more eclectic because you know our lives are are eclectic. They're complicated, you know. Right. And I don't think that people have to be pigeonholed into one style. It doesn't have to be craftsman style. It could be eclectic with some craft, right. you know, with with the main components being craftsmen, you know. Yeah, I love your point about how, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't be, you know, designing for, you know, a look to last 20 years or more, right? I mean, because you change, mm -hmm. taste change, Absolutely. your needs will change, your lifestyle will change, right? Why not change your environment along with that? Otherwise, you get sort of just like trapped or like stuck, you know, like you don't, you don't progress, yeah. you know, I mean, like you, we've all, we all, we all, well, I'm a realtor, you know, I go into houses all the time where literally nothing has changed in 40 years, right, you know, and that's, <laughs> That's kind of sad, really, you know, because it, I think it means that the people's lives haven't really changed that much in 40 years, you know, and it's like right. variety is a spice of life, you know, <laughs> you wanna, I want to add a little bit more to your environment and, and uh, you know, stimulate yourself. Without a doubt, so, and, and I think it's that thing of like the perspective, change the environment, you get a different perspective, right? And I think I, that that is a part of, you know, a part of life too is just, our perspectives change. The way that we work out changes. The the way that we, you know, our families grow up and people move in and out of our lives. There's all of that perspective shift happening all the time. So design can be the same way. Right, right. Hey, so how do you decide what projects are a good fit for you? I mean, like, do people call you over and you just say, like, nah? <laughs> or uh, what, what kind of stuff do you really like to work on the most? Well, there's definitely um, some times where I, I will say nah, and um, I'm curious by nature, and I love the challenge of bringing the vision to life. The things that I love most um, are working with clients who have an idea 
of what they're wanting, but they're not really sure how to execute it, right? Isn't that why you call a designer? It's like, I, I, I love this color. I have this fabulous sofa, but I'm stuck. And right. so I do, I do love working with people in that regard. I also love coming through and just, you know, doing the consultation. The things that you and I have been doing most recently is also just a wonderful and fun, interesting uh, thing to do. Because I think one of the things about me is that I love a changing environment. And that's partly why I'm in this type of work. Because it's always different. And then you're dealing with people and their personalities and their lives and their needs and their wants and their dreams and their, um, and their personal ideas about things. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have really, they have a really great design sense, but they just need an extra push, right? Or there's a lot of people out there also who have no idea how to bring it all together. And they have good pieces but they just don't have them placed properly or they just don't really have the right wall color or they just need to really think outside of the box. And so that's one of the things that, that I love to bring is just all of my ideas and the people that I meet with, um, that's what they pay me for is like my ideas and the, the, the ability to execute the vision that they have. I think one of the things is too that it's fun for people to say, okay, I trust you, just do it. And that, that doesn't happen a super, super lot. That's one of the things is like being a designer is not like being in a design show. Being a designer is about going and talking to the client, client and really taking what they want and making that happen. What I want doesn't matter what I want. If I'm trying to get you to want what I want, there could be trouble. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you lots of suggestions. I'm going to give you lots of ideas. But ultimately, my client is going to have the final say on that. It's your money. It's your budget. It's your time frame, Right? So I love the collaborative piece. I have also worked with people where it's just the man I was telling you that I got him to get, you know, we put the wallpaper up on his focal wall in his master suite. He basically said, here's my budget, just do it. And I would just say, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm doing, I've got these things ordered, this is what's coming, let's get the electrician in there. And he came out really happy about that. Right. Well, it's yeah, kind of a risk, but, though, right? I mean, like, if, you, if it's not a collaborative process, and they just say, you yeah. know what, just go to town. I'm going to be out of town for a month. When I come back, I want my house done. <laughs> it's kind of a risk, right? You know, because... It, you know, it's absolutely a risk. Yeah, right. it's a risk. The thing about that, though, is if, if I'm listening and paying attention to you, my client, I'm going to know how far I can push. I'm going to know what my budget is. I'm going to know... If you're, if I'm, I'm going to know a lot. I'm not going to know everything, but that's one of the things um, that, for me personally, I, um, I guess, well, maybe I'm, a, I guess I'm a bit of a risk taker because I'm willing to stand behind that decision, right? If it's, if it's, we're, if we're talking tens of thousands of dollars, you're, I'm going to, you're going to get my phone call. You're going to get pictures. We're going to collaborate on that stuff. If it's a few thousand dollars and you're telling me, I want this rug, I want these colors, this, or this is what the room should look like and feel like, you know, that's, you will let me know. You will inform me about how far I can go with these decisions, you know? Right. So, so you kind of prefer, it sounds like, it sounds like you prefer to have a collaborative process versus just like, you know, you tell me in broad outlines what you want, and then I'll deliver something for you, and you'll be happy with it. Well, yes, that's the thing. I think one of the things about that is, you know, that's where the brief comes in. The, the, the client says, this is what I want. This is how much money I can spend. And then I, I go, and I create something. I bring it back, and I say, this is what I'm seeing. I've got a color palette for you. I've got some soft finishes. I've got a, you know, a reconstruction of the interior so that it, it's a, maybe you need it set up in a different way. Maybe you need a bigger space. 
right? So how do we do that with what you have? We need to take a wall out, things of that nature. Um, so yeah, I don't, I have, yeah, I don't just go totally crazy and, and just go off the deep end on that stuff because I want the client to be happy, you know, because it's the client's money that's being spent. Right. Hey, so speaking of money, like, how do you get paid? I mean, because, like, on Jeff Lewis Design, I know he takes the client down to the furniture store, and he gets, like, 10% of everything they buy, right? And, and right. I assume it's similar for, like, when he hires a contractor or whatever, he just gets a, a commission on top of the, of the cost of the job. Is that how you guys get paid, generally speaking, or is it a flat fee, or how does all that work? Well, you know, I have had a tendency to not, get paid by what my clients are buying, I have a tendency to um, talk with the client about what the job is going to consist of. Um, I'll bid it. We come to some agreement about that. And then, of course, while working on budget, I'm looking for the most cost-effective ways to execute that for my client. I'm not getting paid by the amount of furniture that the client is buying. Um, occasionally on some of, the, if I buy, if I order stuff online, there are a couple online services that I use where it's like, oh, you, you have spent this much money, you get a, you know, a 2% discount on something. So the discount is small, but I usually pass it on to my clients because I want my clients to be happy and they're paying me. So yeah, they pay me by the job. That's how that works. Right, so it's it's not by the hour, it's just by the job. You just say, hey, you know, my services will be, you know, five grand or whatever for, for this job kind of thing. Exactly. Is, yeah. that standard, I mean, is that standard in the industry or is it more like the Jeff Lewis thing where people get paid based on the amount of stuff that you buy? Yeah, there's that. That is, that is an industry standard is to get paid on um, who's buying what. Um, right. I don't know that I find that to be the most effective way to do it because uh, I want my clients to save and to be to be happy also. Right. Um, one of the things that I do do that um, that I'm happy and proud of in my in my own way is um, that I donate a percentage of all the fees that I make to um, some local charities. Oh, that's and great. And I just, yeah, I just feel like that's an important thing for me. So it also helps what, what clients charities feel do you support? like... What, what charities do you support? Well, I ha- locally, I have Mariposa's Art, which is for um, after-school kids and kids that don't have access to, to, um, to art. And I think that every child, every person needs an outlet for their creativity um, because all people are creative. You know, whether that's, you know, they write books or they they write code, you know, or they like to paint. Um, so Mariposa's art, I also love um, Habitat for Humanity. That's more of a, that's a bigger charity, of course. But the, um, the other one is Second Harvest Food Bank. Oh. Um, I'm an advocate for the American Red Cross. I mean, there's, you know, there's so many. So um, just ongoing Donate some. I think the for this the one this month will be Mariposa's art. I've got some. Uh, I was just tallying up yesterday what I have to um, pay to Mariposa's art, and you know, I think I'm just going to do it on a rotation basis. So maybe for three months I do Mariposa's art, and then the next one will be you know Second Harvest is always wonderful around the holidays, but that's not the only time that they need money. Right. Right. Okay, well, that's really cool. I didn't realize that. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So speaking of buying stuff for your clients, which I think is really great that you don't charge a commission because I think then subconsciously a lot of people would be steering their clients to like more expensive stuff, right? And I'm really right. glad to hear that you like you know are very conscious of your client's budget. But speaking of furniture and stuff like that, where where is a good place around here to go and buy like cool like furniture or like awesome flooring or, you know, uh, just, I mean, are there studios where people can go to get, like, inspired about what to put in their houses? What, what do you like to go locally for that kind of stuff? Well, super locally here in Santa Cruz, um, excuse me, I love Modern Life on 41st Avenue. They've got a pretty interesting and eclectic uh, bunch of furnishings. They've got some great... Um, 
rug choices, uh, you know, squares that you can look at, take with you, um, and that are, that are good quality. Um, so there's that. I think that um, Santa Cruz Kitchen and Bath does a pretty good job here in our little town. And then Carpet One is a good one for flooring and carpet. They have some, we got a smoking deal for one of my clients uh, at the end of the year last year. They have this new nanotechnology on carpet where it's stain proof. It's, you know, you can spill water or wine or you can have pets. And literally, you can wipe it up. It's, it, it repels uh, stains. Really, you can you can I can I can pour out a bottle of red wine on my carpet and I'll just wipe it right off. Is it does it feel soft and nice like regular carpet, or does it feel like you're walking on plastic? It does, it does, and it's a very high quality um, carpet as well. Uh, so they're 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 really helpful there. They they show up when they say they will. They they measure. They give you an estimate. You know, you want to make sure, you know, <laughs> we were getting carpet put in around the holidays last year. So, you know, there's that, uh, a lead time, of course. But there's always a lead time on the good stuff and the stuff that you want. You just have to plan for that kind of stuff. So um, there's also in San Jose, there's a Scandinavian design outlet. I love those clean lines. I love that kind of light, fresh feeling for interiors because, again, if you collect sculpture, um, you want to have those pieces, uh, your sculpture or your art or your, you know, even if you're doing antique furnishings or things of that nature, you want to have those pieces be able to shine. So by, by using some um, lighter or less heavy or more subtle uh, interior furnishings, you can really showcase your, your, your great stuff, your great design. And then, of course, I love going to the San Francisco Design Center. You want to get inspired, go to the Design Center. They have a lot of stuff that, I mean, they're very, they do very trend-oriented uh, stuff, but you can go and look at rugs. You can look at furniture. You can look at uh, fixtures for your bathroom, your kitchen. Um, they have very interesting things, and they're forward, too. It's their, the designs are progressive and interesting, and um, it's just a wonderful way to spend the day. You know, you, you'll get full just by going there. You'll get inspired. You'll get inspired and or overwhelmed. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and or overwhelmed. That looks like a place I should go. I mean, that seems like a, a fun place to go and do, like a Facebook Live as you walk through there. I'm on their website yes. right now, and uh, it does look super cool. Hey, and speaking of websites, are there any websites that you go I mean, like House is one. I mean, like, are there any websites you go to where you find a lot of cool design elements to uh, incorporate? Or? Hmm. Well, I love to, to pop into HGTV because they've got, you know, easy ways for – consumers to do upgrades and add if interesting flourishes. I mean, that's just a real straightforward, fun one. Architectural Digest is beautiful. Um, I love Architectural Digest because it's basically, it's design porn, right? I mean, you can just see all these gorgeous colors and textures and interiors and designers and art and, you know, the high-end stuff that, that most Americans don't use or afford, but you can um, model after those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right on. All right. Well, we've got to wrap things up here. Um, how can people get a hold of you if they want to, uh, to talk to you or consult with you or whatever? Well, I have a website, and it's www.eyedesignhouse.com. My email is idesignhouse at gmail.com, and my phone number is 831-419-4900. Right on. Very good. All right. Well, uh, before we wrap things up, is there anything that uh, you want to let people know about? Do you have any um, special information you want to share? I don't know. Any, any kind of cool events that people might want to go check out or anything you know, interesting you want to pass on before we call it a day here? Well, I would say that if you are really interested in um, doing some redesign in your interior 
and you want to take a fabulous field trip, go to the Design Center in San Francisco. It's free to go in. There's, I think it's four or five floors. The last time I was there, they were re the whole fourth floor was closed. They were doing redesign of the Design Center. Um, but you can get ideas and inspiration. And you know, you can Google just about any other thing that you're interested in in that regard. And uh, just keep your eyes open. Look around your your work or home environment with uh, fresh eyes and see where you can do some fun and easy upgrades or just start fresh and get a fresh perspective. Right on. Okay, very cool. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you uh, spending the time with us today, Danette. Thanks, Seth. Thanks for having me. Talk soon. All you. right. Very good. All right, we'll catch you on the flip side. That wraps up episode number 22 of the Bay to Bay podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to my conversation with Danette. And if you did enjoy the conversation and you have an iPhone and you use the Apple podcast app, which I know a lot of you do, would you do me a huge favor and go and leave the Bay to Bay podcast a five-star review uh, through the podcast app on iTunes? That would really help spread the word about the podcast. And I would be deeply in your debt. And I want to remind you of one thing that, as always, the Bay to Bay podcast is sponsored by thesoldbook.com. That's right. Go to thesoldbook.com to order a free copy of my book, Get It Sold. It's all about how to sell your home quickly, easily, for the highest price possible, and have a fun time doing it. You know, this book does sell for 13 bucks on Amazon.com, and believe it or not, people actually do buy it there. But why when you can get it for free just by going to thesoldbook.com to order it there and check it out. If you use the coupon code free ship at checkout, I'll even ship it to you for free with no shipping charges either. So don't delay. Go to thesoldbook.com and order your free copy of my book today. Hey, thanks again so much for listening to my podcast. I really appreciate that you have been listening and uh, stay tuned. I'll have another episode up for you again soon. Thanks so much. Until next time.